occasions and talks and even documentaries that we've done together. Uh, Dr. Wasim is a PhD immunologist at Eastern Virginia Medical School. He's also currently uh, in medical school. Uh, his career is diverse in background, as you would expect. Uh, he's the Chief Scientific Officer for Stability.ai. Uh, he also helped direct the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy Project from a clinical perspective um, with Kaggle called Cord19. He sits on several advisory boards, both private and uh, governmental. Uh, he's worked with the UN on partnerships for global data access frameworks, as well as the WHO Group for Regulatory Considerations on AI and Healthcare. All on top of going to medical school, Dr. Wasim. I'm not quite sure how you do it all. Helps that it's online this time. <laughs> I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. And Dr. Wasim is also uh, the one who set up this evening's talk with uh, EVMS. Uh, Tayeb, would you like to give a little background on who is our audience tonight and uh, who are we going to be speaking to? Yeah, so this was really spearheaded by two clubs at EVMS, the, I think, Evidence-Based Medicine and Research Club, as well as the new Informatics Club. Um, and really, there was a lot of interest, both from medical students, as well as residents and attending physicians on getting involved in this new space, as we've seen it take off with COVID-19. That's awesome. So special thanks to those interest, interest groups and to EVMS. Um, I'd like to bring on our next panelist now, Dr. Richard Manassi. Hey, Jose, how are you today? Hey, my friend. Good, Rich. How are you doing, buddy? Doing all right. Beautiful day here in Tampa, Florida. Can't complain. I think we're hitting the low 90s. Uh, so <laughs> summer is here, whether we like it or not. That's nice, man. Here in Virginia, uh, we had a nice day, too. It was a little overcast, a uh, little light rain, but for the most part, it was, it was cool, kind of in the low 80s. Um, so I can't complain from that perspective. But I'd like to introduce you to the audience. Uh, there's a lot to be said for Dr. Richard Minasi. He is uh, he's a good friend and a colleague. Uh, I met Richard when we were working together at NASA ITAC. Uh, for those of you who have not heard of ITAC, it's an accelerator uh, focused on helping solve uh, the 2030 Mars mission objective. So it's a NASA accelerator trying to bridge public and private partnerships to solve those solutions uh, that NASA still has. Uh, deals a lot with human health, but really expands the gamut in technology. Uh, Dr. Manassi is obviously a medical physician, as you see here, uh, but he's gotten his MBA and he's worked really in entrepreneurship and in innovation his entire career. Uh, he's worked with several startups, uh, worked from ideation stage to growth strategy and exit stage. Uh, he currently is a, a co-founder. He has several uh, startups that he's a part of, uh, but Blackfin, he's also raising a venture capital fund for biotech, uh, and working on some amazing technology that involves AI, but really uh, everything that has to do with deep technology, emerging technology, not just in healthcare, but in other sectors as well. Richard, is there anything else you'd like us to know about your just historic uh, uh, milestones that you've met throughout your career? Yeah, absolutely. No, I think you hit it all on the head. Uh, pretty involved from a, both a, a heavy regional perspective, Gulf Coast, uh, so involved with TMCX out of Houston, Mass Challenge out of both Houston and Boston, um, and then as well, of course, the Tampa Bay Wave where I'm the director of a technology accelerator that helps early stage tech companies move and move quickly uh, from essentially ideation stage through exit. A number of our companies have done quite well for themselves in the healthcare space as of late. In fact, if you look at the portfolio for the Tampa Bay Wave, uh, I basically handpicked every healthcare company that's come through the program in the last three years. A couple of notes, Hoy Health out of the New York, New Jersey area, uh, Neuroflow, which is out of Philadelphia. They just closed a Series B of 20 million, focused on mental and behavioral health. And then also Immertech, uh, which Dr. Mori is on the advisory board on. Um, that is a company right here in Tampa. I met them when they were about three guys. Uh, they were just developing a virtual reality platform focused on training surgeons in the operating room. Um, they are currently getting ready to do some pretty big things that I can't say on camera, um, but it's going to be a great year for them in 2021. Um, that's just a small number of uh, what keeps me busy for my day-to-day. -day. As Dr. Mori mentioned earlier, uh, I also am in the process of setting up a venture capital fund focused on healthcare technologies, either located in the Gulf, having gone through an incubator or accelerator in the Gulf, with an anchor client in the Gulf, or spun out of a university in the Gulf. But that being said, very happy to be here today to try to add to this conversation uh, with this great group of uh, physicians here in the room and, and one physician on the way uh, in the room. Uh, and then also share anything I can to help all of you here 
joining in along your journey when it comes to technology and healthcare. Yeah, so for all anybody that's listening to this right now and everybody here at EVMS, uh, Dr. Richard Manasi, look him up on LinkedIn. Uh, that's he's very active and popular there. Uh, he is a he's a person that you can connect with. That he's always willing to help out. Um, obviously, he's very busy, so if he doesn't reach out back to you, uh, give him some time. Uh, but there are plenty of startups, plenty of mid stage startups, early stage startups, and late stage startups in health tech. Uh, and these are the kinds of things that I know are really interesting to the people we're talking to. They all they all have machine learning and data. Everything is involves data nowadays, but obviously uh, AI to different degrees. So all these things are the different types of things that you can be involved with, not just from medical school, but as after you graduate. These there's a different there's so many things you can do with your career. Yes, you can go into uh, front end medicine and you can do a, a residency and a fellowship and you can be doing those kinds of things. But there's so much more that you can do, especially in today's day and age that we really need MDs that are being involved in the tech space. We need more. It's kind of a bit of a soapbox of mine uh, because we come from a very different ethos than your uh, typical engineers that are going to be coming out of Silicon, Silicon Valley or other kind of areas. They don't have the mindset that we have when it comes to how we take care of patients, the things that need to be done. And then also, if you actually start working within healthcare, the understanding kind of the politics and the way healthcare works, how the way reimbur reimbursement works, the types of logistics and workflows. These are all things that technology companies from AI to whatever are looking for. So there's a lot of value if you're in an MD going into the space. And the way that we're taught to be critical thinkers is very different uh, than other kinds of industries and other kinds of educations. So we actually have a very unique skill set when it comes to ideation and trying to solve a pain point, which is what innovation and startups are all about. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started for uh, from some of the questions from the audience. And uh, this is on YouTube Live as, as well as uh, many other locations right now with our partner Halo Space. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to start with the first question here. Uh, so from the audience, we had some original questions. I'll tell you, I'll give it to you first and then Richard to you. Uh, tell you, you're actually working. You're, you're a medical student and you're working in really cool projects. So I think you're the poster child for what this whole conversation is about. Um, but in your perspective and from your experiences, what are some paths to find uh, an AI expert who will collaborate or a technology company who will collaborate with medical students? How did you start your journey and how how's that been and how can other people learn from you? Yeah, so I think it all, all starts with just being informed. So, you know, the onus is on you to prove that you're actually passionate about the field. I think if you go to somebody who's very, uh, you know, a diehard basketball fan, they'll name you every coach in the past 20 years. Um, if you say you're actually, you know, passionate about doing tech and medicine, you should know who the big names in the field are and what they're working on. You know, you should, you should know who Daniel Kraft um, is, you know, the chair, chair, chair of the university or, um, you know, different folks at Stanford High. Um, but then once you kind of have the big names, then you can start attending these conferences because you know where they're talking and you know at these conferences they're going to be doing the most um, innovative presenting. So you'll be on top of the field and you'll know what's actually going on so that when you actually have these conversations with the folks who actually are very excited to meet people coming into this space, um, there's not very many people working in the tech medicine space um, as big as it's gotten. And so they get very, very excited when you're actually passionate about it and are starting to join this new ecosystem. Um, I'd say create a LinkedIn. That's that, I think that's something that most, uh, everyone does doximity in medicine, but you know, if you wanna get involved in outside of pure medical space, get a LinkedIn. And then, you know, after one of these conferences, after watching these talks, a lot of the, a lot of big guys will, you know, put their email address and say, hey, here's a project I'm working on. I'd love to have help on it. Um, and unlike just pure academia um, in tech, they actually pay, pay you for your work. So, uh, you know, nobody works for free in tech. And they'll, they'll pay you to come just use your skill set, whether it's looking through charts or uh, evaluating a product and testing it out. Um, send them a message. And, you know, don't be afraid to double ping them. You know, you'll double text, double email, triple email them. They'll get back to you eventually. 
Richard, how about your in your experience? I mean, you uh, why don't you tell a little bit about how you came uh, to do what you're doing? Uh, because you did not go do a residency, correct? You went directly into 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 tech, into innovation, and you've had an amazingly successful career. So, how did you come to that decision uh, to do what you did? Uh, and then, how do you seek out uh, medical students or other clinicians? And is there a need for more in your in your opinion? Yeah, absolutely. First thing I'll say. Um, Everyone gets paid in tech. Good for me to know that because I give a lot of stuff away for free. So I'm going to start charging that out. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Anybody, by the way, anyone who wants to reach out to me uh, should be able to get my LinkedIn as well as my email address uh, sent over into the chat for the viewers. Feel free to reach out anytime. Uh, first and foremost, I kind of fell into tech. Uh, it's kind of funny. I didn't think I was going to go down this route. Um, when I was wrapping up my clerkship training in Atlanta, um, I 100% I thought I was going to go down the hospital administration route. Um, in fact, I was in Los Angeles and I was part of ACHE. I think I was one of the youngest um, interns slash fellows uh, maybe in the regional history. Um, worked very closely uh, with CEO from DHS over there. Um, and then while all that was happening, I had a friend from Minneapolis tell me about a friend of his who was moving to California um, out of the blue, and she didn't know anybody. She knew that my background with regards to the region is where I grew up. Um, we lived there for a number of years. They said, hey, look, do you want to meet her? She's working on like a website or something. And I said, yeah, sure, absolutely. More than happy to help her out, get plugged in. That ended up being a tech startup. Um, she was literally getting it up and off the ground. I helped her. That did quite well. We worked on it together. It ended up uh, getting uh, taken off the shelf uh, in a very nice little acquisition. Uh, no complaints on my end. When that happened, I thought, holy cow, this, this world's pretty awesome. I did go to undergrad at UC San Diego um, and basically was surrounded by computer programmers. So I knew the world, but I didn't realize how much I would get into it. I was thought I would always be kind of tangentially involved. Um, but I got to tell you, after that first startup and the next couple of ones, uh, I was all in very, very quickly. And it's what I've been doing for the last 12 years, primarily out of the southern part of the United States, since I hate snow. Um, so out of California, Texas, and in the Tampa Bay region. Along the way, a couple of different companies in medical diagnostics, medical education, a small plane to biotech in there as well as travel and entertainment and media. A current company builds software for hospital CFOs. Um, that company has deployed to some of the largest hospitals in the U.S. We have multiple top 25s at the CFO level actually leveraging our software currently. Um, but, you know, my give back is really to the community. Um, I'm very, very bullish on healthcare and technology. I have been for several years, especially around the Gulf in particular. Um, and I do have to tell you, uh, I think the future is bright with regards to healthcare. And though COVID um, has unfortunately been a black mark on the history of our country and how we have handled it and the response and, and you know the, the high death toll and even now how people are reacting, it did do one thing and that's it kind of woke people up to the transformation that still needs to happen in healthcare. And there's been some great things happening and happening quite quickly in the last six months to a year that I'm hoping continue to build up momentum over time. That's amazing. Um, and we'll put some of these companies into the, the chat so you guys can see what's going on um, that Richard mentioned um, a little bit later. Blackfin is one of the companies he just he just referenced. Uh, Oi Health he referenced earlier. Immertech. Um, uh, MedZoomer is perhaps not one that you mentioned, but it's another one that's out there as well. I think you mentioned one more. We'll put all those there. And then Tampa Bay Wave um, is his accelerator. And I'll, I would echo both what Richard and what Tayeb said. Um, reach out. So if you get both groups, it's kind of like those old sayings, you know, by your friends, you'll, you kind of know yourself or birds of a feather kind of thing. So if you only go to medical conferences, you're only going to know your, that your network is only going to extend into medicine. If you want to get into tech, if you want to go get into AI, you have to, you have to leave what you're comfortable with. You have to leave your comfort zone and go to those places that uh, the technologists are going to be, that AI specialists are going to be. Now there are some things that straddle the fence. There are there are some organizations that are healthcare oriented that also do some some AI and tech. For example, SIM, Society of Imaging, uh, Informatics and Medicine, which is radiology focused. They do a lot of AI, but realistically, those tend to be very uh, few and far between. Really, you want to get out in those IEEEs. Uh, you want to go to the South by Southwest. You want to go to those conferences that have a lot of tech space. And the, the reality is that you're going to be a diamond in a rough for them there because you're going to be so unique. The fact that you have an MD because just as much as anyone that's listening to this wants to be involved in AI and wants to be involved in, in healthcare startups, they are the same way. They don't know how to access you. They have no idea how to find you. 
Um, so going to them is really one of the best ways that you can be involved with these kinds of things. Uh, because if not, then you kind of just kind of encircle yourself. And I was the same way. I didn't realize that I wanted to do this. I thought I was just going to go into private practice. I thought that was going to be my career. That's always kind of what I envisioned once I started studying medical school. It really was towards my end of my residency where I started getting enamored with data analytics. That's really where where kind of my journey started. Um, and then that opened up the opportunity uh, to go work with IBM. And then once I started going out to IBM, which was in San Jose, uh, I started getting involved in the whole ecosystem that's out there between Silicon Valley and San Francisco, uh, Menlo Park. And that's really where all these networks and connections started kind of taking me down different paths. And honestly, you know, be willing. And yes, Tayeb is it's nice if he gets paid for everything starting out. It's amazing. You might not always get paid starting out, but that's still fine. You know, be willing to go out and be willing to explore. And, um, you know, besides Eastern Virginia Medical School, I'm sure others are going to see this. Uh, and there are a lot of opportunities, even within your own facility, facility and ecosystem. You know, here in the Hampton Roads area, uh, there are... Uh, there are uh, other universities and other things that are going on. There are a small growing kind of bubble and ecosystem. So explore what you have in your community. If you're in Philadelphia, uh, if you're in Austin, if you're in Atlanta, if you're in Miami, you know, not every place has to be Silicon Valley. Not every place has to be New York. You know, take advantage of the networks that you have in your location. And then when you go on and you meet new people, leverage those and start learning those. And that's why things like LinkedIn are, are very important. Doximity, as Tayeb said, you're just going to meet physicians. If you go out to these other kinds of uh, social media outlets, then that kind of expands your network. So those are the kinds of things that you need to be to be leveraging. But you are very valuable to the tech sector um, because they need that expertise and they are looking for that expertise, whether it's kind of uh, starter types of things like going through charts or whatnot, or whether you get to the point where you are a chief medical officer or you are an, on an advisory board or a cab. Uh, where you're actually ideating and you're strategizing what they should be doing and product development. And all these things are skill sets that you will develop over time. Uh, all these things, you'll see them as you go through the process. Go out there, go to hackathons, uh, search for hackathons in your local area, or perhaps one that you can drive to that's in a bit of a bigger city uh, and be involved with those things because it builds to your ecosystem. And then you'll start getting to know people that can code or people that can do social media uh, or people that have very different skill sets. And when you put diverse people from diverse backgrounds uh, into something like a hackathon, that's where innovation happens. And that's where you really start getting really novel solutions to things. So stretch your boundaries, go beyond what you have, go beyond what you're normal. It's medicine is very unique in that it's uh, very paternalistic and structured. And, you know, we've done it the same way. It's that whole apprenticeship thing. And, you know, you're going to go into, you know, your first year, the second year, you know, when you're going to take your steps. And then you always kind of know one or two years ahead of time what you're going to be doing for like three to five years, right? Um, tech entrepreneurship, it's not like that. The startup kind of scene, it's not like that. You you have an idea, you're building, you're doing this really fun stuff, and then you're pivoting. And it's uh, things aren't kind of scripted for you. But you can learn certain skill sets that will help you be more successful, have the probability of success be higher when you start developing these things. But it's a very different type of level of comfort that you have to get used to to be able to be kind of in in this in this ecosystem. So you have to be comfortable with that. Um, our next question that we have uh, from the pre uh, ordained questions here. Uh, Tayeb, again, to you first, is it realistic for a medical student to become competent in AI within a short period of time? Uh, I, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head right before this, Jose. I don't think you have to become competent in AI. I think your skill set is leveraging what you know about healthcare, with, about medicine. Um, and going to these other tech companies because at the end of the day, they're going to code circles around you. They don't, they don't need people who can code. What they need is people who understand healthcare and even just basic terminology for them of, you know, differentiating one word versus another or one study versus another. Um, I think that's where your power as somebody in the medical field is. So I wouldn't necessarily take all the time to, to go out and learn coding. Um, if you want to, I think Python's a fun one because the syntax is easy and it's easier to learn. And it does help you understand what everyone else is saying in the room if you have a basic grasp of coding. But I wouldn't focus my time trying to become, you know, a master coder. 
do you know do you code uh like do you know python i i do so my my background was in uh computer science but I'm a garbage coder, and I, anytime I have to hard code something, um, a group of programmers will go in behind me, and my hundred lines of code will they'll turn it into ten and make it more efficient. And I just learned that if I have a general idea of what needs to get done, and I can explain it to them, of I know what the code should do, but you can do it better than I can. And here's the output on the medical or research side; they'll be able to make that happen. And because you can kind of speak both languages, it works really well. Yeah, that, that's a really, really good statement. I don't know if I would change anything of what he just said. Uh, here's the truth of the matter. All of you here watching this chat have lived your lives to get to this specific point of being medical students, maximizing your opportunities to break into healthcare. And that's awesome. Um, understand that the people that are out there working in tech that are hard coders, for the most part, have been doing the exact same thing their whole life, but focus specifically on coding. And no matter how good you try to get, you're always going to be 10, 12 years behind. And in the process of you trying to catch up, they're just going to continue to be 10 or 12 years ahead of it. Um, and that's a hard truth. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, in fact, I just had a conversation this weekend uh, from a former partner at PricewaterhouseCooper, incredibly brilliant guy. And he told me, oh, I'm, I'm going I'm to build this and I'm finishing up. Um, you know, he's doing a master's uh, in MBA. And he said, yeah, yeah, at the same time, learn to code. And I'm going to kind of stand this thing up. And I just asked him, I said, how good do you think that whatever you're going to build is going to be? And he goes, well, it's, it's going to be good. And I said, it's not. I guarantee you right now it's going to be terrible. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to do everything all the time. And you certainly will never be the best at everything at all times. Um, it's a, something, it's a hurdle. For some reason, I see PhDs and MDs who are uh, launching tech companies. They continue over and over again to have this thought process that they can just do everything themselves. So the truth of the matter is um, this is a very hard uh, world to explore, to really understand how to build, launch, and grow a tech company. That is a unique skill set with unique um, critical needs that need to come from human capital. And no one thing, one person can do everything, right? Steve Jobs had Wozniak, right? Uh, Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook had all those guys he ripped off in Eduardo. Um, and the list goes on and on. There's always more than one. Even Bill Gates, you know, he had uh, Balmer and the rest of his guys up at Microsoft. And the truth of the matter is uh, you are best served understanding what you're an absolute subject matter expert at that is in high demand, and that is healthcare. But where you can add significant value in a sm small period of time is understanding how to better communicate within the tech sphere, understanding how the world of technology works, ensuring that you have a baseline understanding of what helps a company get up and off the ground and through their pre-seed, seed, series A, what that pattern is because so much of what we do on the tech side, whether it's healthcare or any other vertical, is pattern recognition over and over again, whether it's by somebody like me, whether it's by other investors, whether it's by people looking to work with you or work alongside of you, whether it's people that are at tech companies that are looking to hire you. Everyone is looking for patterns to mimic success and figure out the path of least resistance to make a large impact both in healthcare, both in product, or, or even you know financially. So just something to kind of hope you all keep in mind. Go to those conferences. I'm on the advisory board for South by Southwest. I've held that role for a number of years. Um, do it. Go to all of these conferences. Really get out there. Learn to meet people. Get in front of others. Say, hey, look, I have an interest in technology. But do your due diligence on not just the companies and people you're interacting with, but also on this world and how it works. And I'd be more than happy to recommend a couple of books in the chat um, that will help you get a nice baseline of things that you should know that are just the most simplistic things, uh, period, with regards to understanding how, um, you know, the language, uh, you know, the patterns for growth, et cetera. Uh, but please do your diligence, um, understand exactly where your particular puzzle uh, puzzle piece fits into things. I mean, you're gonna do just fine, no matter whether it's healthcare, whether it's technology, whether it's government, no matter what it is, um, as long as you understand how things work and you do your diligence, you're going to be just fine and successful in it. Yeah, great words. Uh, great words of wisdom from both you guys. Thank you. And I I would echo the same thing. It's very few and far between in which the, they're going to 
any any MD is going to have to do any kind of coding. Uh, the vast majority of people that have an MD are going to be brought in for that particular skill set. They're not looking for your your skilling, your your, your coding skill set. You know, um, the only time that you would want is if if you're embedded with a team that's doing a, a doing a lot of that. But again, it's going to be a handful of positions that have both of those skill sets. Uh, it's going to be very unique uh, to be doing that and to play that role. Um, but if you are interested, yes, the things that you want to learn, if you want to code things on your own and you want to do your own thing, Python is pretty typical for, for AI. Uh, right now, it's kind of a very easy uh, language to learn. Uh, there's a lot of online courses that are free, uh, whether you want to do like Khan Academy or edX or Udemy, or there's, there's plenty of them out there that you don't have to pay for that you can learn introductory uh, kind of coding and you can just download everything for free and, and take courses. You can always pay to get certified in it if that's something that you want. Uh, IBM has courses as well that are free. Uh, that you can take. Google has free courses that you can take. Um, so does Microsoft. So it's it's getting very, very popular to have these online courses. Um, and a lot of people are us utilizing them to upskill, uh, which is very important. So, But it's not something that is definitely going to be required for 95% of physicians uh, to get into the space. Now, I'm a strong proponent that we should all understand code to a certain degree, but that's my kind of STEM education background. That, uh, that, I'm a, that I think it should be a second language, just like uh, you know French or Spanish or whatever else we teach in schools. Uh, I think coding is something that we should teach in school for everyone because especially from in the healthcare perspective, eventually AI is going to be ubiquitous and we're going to be using it in all sorts of diagnostics um, and even in some therapeutics as well, potentially. And realistically, it's going to be like, just like when you guys learn about CT scans or MRIs or different blood tests, you're going to want to know what's the limitations of those things. Uh, so understanding those kinds of things are, it's very important. It's more, I think, if you understand the data, like where the data is coming from. The other big thing is to make sure that as these AI applications are being developed, that we're not uh, bringing along systemic inequalities that were baked into the kind of uh, the data set that they learned from. So understanding that sometimes that can induce or perpetuate inequalities, those kinds of things are you should know about and you should educate yourself on. Just like with anything else, if you have a patient, you have to understand their cultural perspective to see how you're going to treat them. You have to understand their socioeconomic uh, background to be able to understand what kinds of things they have access to. Those are the kinds of things that you need to be understanding and, and bringing to the table. Um, one question from the pre-recorded questions, and then we'll start taking some questions here from the audience as well. Um, in your guys' perspectives, uh, Richard, I'll start with you this time. What do you think is going to be the biggest impact of AI in medicine over the next coming years? So, you know, uh, it's a great question. I think there's a lot of different uh, areas that AI is currently impacting healthcare and low into the future, everything from radiology um, to analytics. Um, but I actually think the impact on the pharma side um, is something to watch and watch very, very carefully with regards to clinical trials, with regards to drug discovery. Um, I think we are about to enter a renaissance when it comes to drug discovery in general. Um, and I think that the leveraging of AI and data and machine learning all within that sphere uh, is going to really shift how health is impacted uh, via new drug discovery well into the next I don't know, maybe the next 20, 30, 40 years. Um, that is what I'm certainly most excited about. Um, but that being said, I mean, cancer recognition, breast cancer in particular, um, I think early, uh, you know, early findings of that, I think is something that's coming up very quickly too. But my eye is specifically on pharma. And I got to tell you, I'm pretty excited about it. Tay, what about you, buddy? I mean, I, I, I love the looking at the back end of, of medicine there with like AlphaFold and how it's going to change just drug discovery. But I, I actually think the biggest transformation that is going to happen is with mobile health. Um, I think, you know, everyone loves to, you know, get on digital and telemedicine because of the digital divide that currently exists. But when you think about mobile phones, most of the world has access to mobile phones and therefore all these new applications and devices that plug into it um, are going to bring healthcare to hundreds of millions of people. Um, and then on, on top of that, it's, it's, a, it's a technology that everyone already has. So you're not trying to ship out new products to people. Um, and the, the tech's getting better and better. Um, there's one company I work with who is doing um, vital signs through the cell phone on the camera or integrating that into a Zoom chat 
And as you have seen that, you know, the, the Medicare has kind of loosened up its guidelines on what they're going to reimburse. Insurance companies have loosened up their guidelines on telemedicine, um, which were frankly just antiquated. Um, and I think that's going to be the biggest push, at least in the next two, three years. Now, a, qu- a follow-up question to this, uh, Tayeb, and then back to, back to you, Richard. Do you think, where do you think this innovation is going to be coming from? Do you see it most from the U.S., or do you see another location um, kind of being the really kind of the tip of the spear when it comes to this type of stuff? Um, I mean, Miami's kind of becoming the new Silicon Valley um, with the way they're, they're, they're incentivizing people to move there. I think the U S is a leader in the space. Um, China is honestly, has always been at the forefront of this. Um, but they're very good about kind of keeping theirs enclosed within their app, like ecosystem. Whereas the things that are developed here tend to proliferate globally much more quickly. Yeah, I would say the U.S. to be completely honest. I think you need to watch the military sector as well. I think there are things that are happening. And, you know, Dr. Mori, I know you and I both kind of play a little bit on that side. So there are things that we've seen that won't be in the commercial sector for a number of years that are very impactful. Um, But I would say the U.S. first and foremost, um, let's be completely honest, this is a capitalistic society. Um, And at the end of the day, a lot of what we do in the startup world is around generating revenues. And uh, a lot of uh, value comes to that. And to the winner goes the spoils. Um, And based on that, I think that's why also historically you've seen a lot of great healthcare breakthroughs come out of the U.S. We are incentivized as physicians and as innovators to push the needle all the time. Sometimes it's good um, with regards to new medical devices, with regards to new drugs moving faster. Sometimes it's bad with regards to Theranos, for example. Uh, But it really comes down to this. Uh, At the end of the day, none of you here in the room are 19-year-old Stanford dropouts that are playing in the world of healthcare. You are physicians and physicians in training. You take this seriously. You will solve these problems. And I will 100% be more than happy to support you in any way that I can. Uh, But remember that and keep that top of mind. Um, The things that you learn and you practice every single day, um, the problems that you're looking to solve, go out and solve them. No one's going to do it for you. And certainly we cannot leave it in the hands of people that don't take healthcare seriously, um, that don't take the patient population seriously. Um, And that blend of healthcare, the the caring for the patient population, plus the drive to make an impact um, can certainly do great things when it comes to healthcare today and tomorrow. Yeah, great words of advice from both you guys. And I'd like to foot stomp that last one from from Richard. You know, it was it was physicians who wanted, uh, you know, different types of insurance policies and different types of uh, reimbursement kind of structures to be developed. But they didn't want to have that discussion. They didn't want to be a part of the solution uh, when managed care was coming into the fray. And now I'm sure when you guys talk to your attendings, you know, we hear it all the time. I still practice part time. Um, you hear it all the time. People are always complaining about reimbursement, having to deal with HMOs, and especially if you have your own clinic. Um, but the, the reality was we weren't at the table when those decisions were being developed. And that, there's that old adage, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Technology is the next big disruptor. It's the next big dislocator for the industry. And if we are not actively engaged in those discussions, then yes, we could be disrupted in ways that we that is a not beneficial to patients and b not beneficial for us as well and like i mentioned before we have a very different perspectives on the patient than someone who's just coding ones and zeros uh, that they will never have because they're not on the front line and they're not the ones to see the ramifications of what happens when you make a mistake or what happens when you make a decision that's not just life and death for one individual life and death touches an entire family you see those ripples uh, throughout an entire neighborhood or a community depending on the individual there what we do is serious and in in the tech sector it's a lot of try fast fail fast and that's great for innovation but when you do that with with a with a human life it's a very, very different perspective. And at speaking of the military, that's one of the interesting things about military innovation that, you know, they come from a very similar perspective as healthcare because they understand the ramifications of making these kinds of life and death decisions. And that's something that Silicon Valley will never have. And that's, in my opinion, the greatest value that you bring to the table with, with these kinds of healthcare startups. Let's take a question from the audience. Uh, Bertie, if you can put that question out. So Surya Gorneni, I apologize if I, uh, if I didn't say the name correctly, but uh, all of you have amazing experience in starting companies and working in startups. What are the challenges you faced when you started and any advice on navigating those? Richard, why don't you take that first and then take it? 
Sure. Uh, the challenges faced with starting the biggest one is get out of your own way. Um, realize your place in things. Uh, I think all of us have made that um, you know that mistake, especially when I think about the other peers that I have that are physicians. That f when they first jump into tech, um, it's automatically well, I can solve any problem, do anything. Um, once you can kind of get over that hurdle and understand how to deal with people as well, that is a critically important skill to have if you're playing in the technology sectors, understanding different personalities. Programmers, very, very unique human beings. Tayeb, you know, I know that uh, you can attest to that, I'm sure. Um, and then the business side of things is very different as well. Um, so, you know, understand how you fit um, and then also do your diligence prior to any engagement, period, period. Um, I can tell you one of my earliest startups, um, I was at a, a conference and uh, I won't say the name of this, but a major Silicon Valley venture capital firm, uh, I'm talking top five, uh, came over to me and started talking to me about my company. I had no idea who they were. I was unprepared. I was very, very young. Um, and, you know, they showed interest and, you know, we didn't really take it seriously. Um, and now I think backwards, I'm like, man, that was a golden opportunity that I didn't pounce on um, because of my lack of preparation. And that's something that I recommend all of you. Really immerse yourself if you're going to jump into this world. Don't jump in with just a toe in the water. Do your diligence and homework. Understand who the players are. How can it be impactful to you and your career? Get an understanding of where you would like to start and where you would like to finish, whether that's being on the founder side, a chief medical officer, a chief scientific officer, whether you want to play in the venture capital world, private equity, um, you know, the list goes on and on. And then from there, uh, ensure that you are fully prepared to get from point A to point B. And then lastly, really leverage people around you. There's so many wonderful people in technology um, and in healthcare that are willing to help you along your journey. Do not be afraid to ask for advice and thoughts um, and do not be afraid to reach out when you need help. Tam? I have to echo the due diligence one. The number of meetings I walked into where I didn't realize this is the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, and I'm just casually addressing him and don't, don't actually know what they actually um, work on um, is was was pretty embarrassing. Um, I'd say understanding the lingo of when you start going in front of VC firms, um, when you start hearing about non-stock options or equity, and all of these just words start getting thrown at you, um, I think it's okay for you to reach out to others and ask them for help. Um, and say, hey, here's 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 the new world that I'm diving into. I'd love to um, get advice. I've I've called Jose plenty of times throughout throughout this experience of here's a company I'm working with. Here's what they're offering. Do you think this is the right way to uh, approach this situation? Um, and then you know those that are actually in this world really really want other people to join this clan. Um, if if you do actually do your due diligence and and know what's going on in the field. They will be more than happy to give you mentorship and guidance and, and show you, hey, here's a project that's up and coming. You expressed an interest. I'd love to get you involved one way or another. Um, but you really can't do the shortcut on the homework. Um, the last thing you want to do is be speaking to somebody who's you know, the founder of a company and you give them an idea that's something they're already doing uh, because you didn't do your homework. Yeah, and I would echo again what Tayeb said. Find mentors. That's true in life for everything. Uh, but if this is something that you're really passionate about, seek out those mentors. Um, and then when once you start having some success, then make sure that you also pay it forward and, and kind of build people up. Uh, it's a very important thing just in general to, to do for in life. Um, let's do another question uh, from the audience. Uh, this is from RJ Andrew. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to hear about uh, AIML, medicine, expanding role of technology in healthcare. In your opinion, do you believe telemedicine will fade post-pandemic? Tab, since you talked about mobile, why don't you take this one first? Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I am confident that it is here to stay. Um, you know, a lot of these uh, outdated, antiquated guidelines that got put in place when HIPAA was first written um, had no idea what actual security looks like when it comes to um, um, getting information from one place to another. Um, now that insurances have started reimbursing it, I think that's another driving factor for for keeping it around. And I might be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure Medicare has also signed off on uh, on on uh, 
getting after telemedicine. And, and on, honestly, I think a lot of providers are now adapting to be able to provide telemedicine on a regular basis and screen patients so that they can send them back um, if they need to in office. Um, I, I spoke to a physician who, who called um, the offices. So they, they see the patients as a pediatrician. And if he thinks he needs to actually be seen in person, then he has an officist um, who only sees the patients based on him pre-screening them. Um, and so that's how their practice is running is one of them works in the office and one of them purely does telemedicine. Richard, with all your startups, what uh, what are you saying? You see telemedicine going away? Sure. Uh, no, <laughs> I don't think that's happening. Um, I think on the West Coast right now, people I don't think understand how integrated uh, remote care is actually happening. Um, I have a relative who is an ER physician um, that is an ER physician from his house. And they ask, how does that happen? Simple, they have a little robot that rolls around with a little tablet. They have a skeletal nursing staff and the ER physicians for the most part are not in person because they're so afraid of them getting sick and COVID. Um, so I think that's just one example of technology. Uh, with regards to telemedicine itself, uh, absolutely not. Do I think it's going away anytime soon? I think we will see a, uh, a drop in overall volume as patients become more comfortable. But I think long-term it is definitely here to stay. Any numbers that we see long-term are gonna be exponentially greater than what they were prior to Q1 of 2020, I guarantee you that. And I honestly think we still have a long way to go when it comes to telemedicine. I was just chatting with the head of Verily for the country of Singapore, and we were talking about solutions that they have there and in other countries throughout uh, Pan Pacific region when it comes to telehealth. And one thing that they're seeing, and that is a lot of value that we just don't have yet here in the US, is a patient can pick up their phone, push a button, see the doctor, and then knock, knock, knock on the door, medication shows up. That is that last aspect is something that is missing. Um, and, you know, shameless plug here. Uh, there's a company that I have a sizable portion of that is looking to solve that very problem that is deep in discussions with United Healthcare and Humana uh, based on their solution that just launched in November and is already pushing into the 10,000s with regards to volume of prescriptions delivered. Um, so there is just so much more still to be done in healthcare when it comes to remote care. Another thing too is you're seeing a real shift of healthcare from inpatient to outpatient. Look what any of you, I implore you to look up what's happening right now in real time with the Shriners Hospital system. They are literally doing a transformational change with an entire organization of moving patients from inpatient to that outpatient surgical experience. It's something kind of really crazy to watch. Shriners International Headquarters is just down the road from me in Clearwater Beach here in Tampa. And then you look at companies throughout the country, OnMed, um, you know, and the list goes on and on of organizations that are providing care in home to patients that simply have outfitted um, you know, cars to go into the patient's homes uh, with an EMT or a nurse prac or a PA or whatever it is doing that at home care. I, I really do see that continuing to ramp over time. That does not mean hospitals and inpatient is going away anytime soon. Um, I just think there'll be additional uh, convenience factors when it comes to play for patients. And honestly, with such a large number of patients not having the transportation ability to even get into clinics these days, uh, I am very, very happy for it, especially when it comes to our underserved populations and our rapidly aging populations as well. Yeah, I uh, completely concur with uh, both of you. I think the example I would give, um, I mean, companies like Roe and Livongo, you have the tech companies that were kind of pre-positioned, though they were the more progressive companies and they were ready for a time like this, right? Like Zoom. Uh, Zoom was just perfect or StreamYard uh, was just perfect for these kinds of things. And they were they were able to take advantage of that. And that's that's where preparation comes in for uh, when you have those kinds of opportunities. And that's part of innovation. But I think that the example that I would give that shows you that this is really more here to stay and become now institutionalized is when you have the larger players that they were always kind of waiting to kind of make these technological leaps. And now COVID forced them to do it. Um, but because now they've done it, now they see the benefits of it uh, and they understand how it can actually increase market and increase uh, kind of efficiencies and decrease cost. So when we have the, the big players like the Blue Cross Blue Shields starting to make those types of partnerships and starting to do reimbursements like that, um, that's when I think you, you can see something is really making uh, an institutional change. The other example I would give is really the client. So if you have a younger population, you have Tayeb, you know, he's a young whippersnapper and he'll go out and he'll pull out his mobile device and see his patients or see his provider real quick to, uh, to do his yearly checkup. 
That's one thing, right? That, that's a younger generation. But when you have people like my parents who are baby boomers, right, when they're 70, and now they've made the transition, and they're the ones that actually utilize their physicians. Because if you're younger, you might see your physician once a year or once every couple of years, just kind of a uh, as a checkup. But when part your you know a large chunk of your life is seeing physicians as you get older, and you make that transition of seeing people in person, when you're so comfortable do the same people in, in person, but now you're making the transition that you would do that when you're that main market driver and you see them doing it. I think that's another thing that kind of signals that this is, this is kind of here to stay. Um, we're, we're at the 10 minute mark. We have a couple, we have a lot more questions to go. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, Bert, do you want to bring up the next question? Uh, telemedicine again, other tech medicine innovations. How do we see them? This is from Fritz. How do we see rural healthcare or vulnerable communities um, uh, being affected or being improved by this? Uh, Rich, why don't you start since you kind of mentioned a, a little bit uh, toward the end of your last uh, question. Sure. Um, about a decade ago, we started seeing consolidation with regards to healthcare throughout the country. Okay. Small community hospitals, rural hospitals getting eaten up by large conglomerates. That's not going to slow down anytime soon. Um, when that happens, what do they do? They shrink and they contract and they try to have healthcare in one area color uh, provide for a larger geography. That's a problem. This is something that I really like with regards to telemedicine. Patients uh, are having issues with mobility. Patients are having issues trying to get, you know, in some cases, hours away to see their physician. Um, and this is where I really see healthcare going into the future too, is just providing that in-person at-home care. We have ways now to track vitals at home, whether it's through the phone or through other devices. We have ways you can do your labs from home with companies like My Lab Box and others. You can go to Target and, and get a box that you can then send in uh, for genetic testing and other types of testing. And I do have to tell you, I'm very, very excited about it. And I think that it's going to stay and really impact those rural communities uh, because they're just not going to go away. Uh, people stay in regions sometimes for generations. They don't have uh, that mobility to go up and down when it comes to social strata from an economic standpoint. And we need to, all of us, need to find ways to provide cares for those patients um, at, equivalent, uh, at equivalent levels that our friends in San Francisco or Austin or Tampa or in Miami are getting. The patient population deserves it. Pam? You're on mute, buddy. Uh, you think I get better at that? I'm gonna I'm gonna echo what you said. Uh, that, was, that was that was beautifully put. I w I will say, you know, on top of just um, you know, getting access to all these folks, I think another thing is is you can start integrating a lot of these technologies in. Um, so while you're doing telemedicine visits, you no longer just need to have that family practice physician that's seeing those patients. You can now get an algorithm that can diagnose diabetic retinopathy right there, and then you know you're getting ophthalmologist level of treatment. Um, for a group that, you know, in theory might never be able to actually get to an ophthalmologist. Um, so not only is it expanding care, but it's also bringing more, more specialty care more rapidly. So, you know, we have a shortage of healthcare workers in the U.S. Um, technologies like these are going to help, you know, um, close that gap that currently exists. Yeah, I would I would echo both those sentiments. Uh, the the whole promise of the Nirvana of AI, one of the things that kind of really drove me to go into the field, is that whole concept of de democratizing healthcare. The fact that we do have, and we've seen it right now, who 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 has COVID affected the most? It's black and brown communities. Why? Because there's a disparate level of care. You have systemic inequality that has embedded itself into the healthcare system. And there's been plenty of um, examples of with uh, machine learning and AI that's actually perpetuated some of that where it said, don't give, the, don't give the same level of care to African-Americans as you do to Caucasians. Why? Because that data was already there that African-Americans don't have as good of outcomes. So it just, it just kind of perpetuated the data that was there. But once you start fixing those underlying inequalities and you start putting in good data, then you really have the opportunity to get care to people regardless of where they are, not just the United States, across the world. Like you can, doesn't matter if you're in Africa, or if you're in Asia, or if you're in Missouri, if you're in Utah, if you're in Florida, AI can democratize healthcare and make sure that everyone gets the same level of care regardless of where they were born, regardless of their socioeconomic status, uh, regardless of what language they speak. That's really where, 
uh, technology can can move the needle forward for all of us. But we still have a ways to go. And I talked about that that lack of data. We still need to get those communities, those underserved communities, whether they be uh, rural or whether they be BIPOC or, or whatnot, uh, you, we need to get them into the data sets and we need to make sure that they're valid data sets uh, that, are, that are appropriately uh, represented. Uh, the NHS and uh, the European Union is doing a much better job at this than we are. They have way more robust data sets that are very diverse. As opposed to our one of our inherent problems here in the U.S., is that we're siloed. Even amongst one healthcare institution, you can have siloed data sets. You go to uh, Harvard and, you know, Beth Israel Deaconess may not communicate with Heart, uh, with Mass General, uh, and then they might not communicate with uh, Brigham and Women. So even large academic centers like that have this problem of, of, of siloed data sets. So still issues that we have here, but you look at companies like MedZoomer, which Richard mentioned, uh, that I also advise at full disclosure, but those kinds of things, you have to think of your patient 360 degrees. It's not just at the point of care. What What is their home life like? Uh, where do they come from? What's their work life like? What are, what are the things that are keeping them from being able to get their medications? Those are the things that we sometimes tend to forget because we get so caught up in, you know, break bone, fix bone kind of mentality from, from medicine. So those are the kind of things that, that I think we're, is coming down the pipeline that can really make a big difference to rural and low income communities. But we still have a lot of work to do and we need more MDs being a part of part of that story. So um, we're coming to an end here. So I want to ask Tayad and Richard uh, for our audience, any last words of advice uh, to the medical students that are looking for this, uh, looking to get into this and being inspired by both of your stories. And I want to thank both of you for taking your time uh, to sit down with us today. Tayab, I'll go to you and then uh, Dr. Manasi, I'll let you close it out. Tayab. Um, I, I think one of the, the takeaways should be that, you know, you're not putting the genie back in the bottle here. Um, AI and tech and medicine is here to stay. Um, it's going to keep getting further and further integrated into clinical practices and workflows. Um, I think those physicians that are going to do the best are the ones who start off by being prepared and understanding how the world works. I mean, I see one of the big promises of AI of getting more equitable healthcare to everyone. Um, not to say that, I mean, there's plenty of bad doctors, let's just be honest. Um, you know, there's at least a quarter million deaths due to mal, not malpractice, but medical errors. Um, and, you know, if I have a physician that's seeing me, I'd rather they have a st smart stethoscope that beats out 90% of primary care physicians in detecting a murmur rather than, you know, someone out of med school for two years who has no idea what they're listening to. Um, but I, I really think, you know, this is the future of medicine and everyone should start trying to get as involved as they can. Um, like Jose and Dr. Wanasi both said, there are tons of ways to get involved. Um, the onus is on you to kind of get informed first and then reach out. Um, you gotta, you gotta sometimes slide into some people's DMs and, and, and they will respond. They, they are more than happy to respond. So just go ahead and do it. And just keep it appropriate. Um, so what I will say, <laughs> what I will say is this, um, if you think that you, this is something that you want to do, if you want to get involved in technology with regards to healthcare, if you want to play in this world, don't wait. Everyone always thinks, hey, I'm going to wait, I'm going to practice for a couple of years, I'm going to circle back. Don't do that because there's never a good time to do this. You have to just go. And that's one of the biggest changes when it comes to uh, technology versus healthcare, the speed at which things move and the ability for you to be fluid with your decision-making, with how quickly you move, um, with your assertiveness, and then also uh, with your ability to step away from the clinical side of things, to focus on what you need to focus on in technology, that is absolutely imperative. Um, the idea to, that you can play kind of in both worlds. I remember I had a talk with a surgeon. Um, this particular surgeon was trying to convince me that they were the CEO of a fast growing tech company that had a lot of promise. And as I dug the surgeon, you know, I, I asked the surgeon, how many hours are you practicing right now? And they're like, oh, 60. And I said, so you're going to tell me that you can be the CEO of a high growth tech startup that's going to be worth millions upon millions upon millions of dollars in your spare time and that you are not going to step away from that role and let someone else who has the background in this world run the show. And they were so adamant that they could do both that, you know, I mean, that never, ever works. And I got to tell you, getting investment and growing your companies to ensure that you can provide your solution to the patient population at scale is a critical aspect to this journey. And no one wants to invest in someone who's going to be spending their money and half-assing it. 
Um, so that's number one. Number two, as you practice and you move forward, things always get more complicated, whether you have your own practice, whether you have your own surgical centers, whether you have family, um, so on and so forth. And the truth of the matter is life only gets more complicated as you get older, as people, more people rely on you too. So just keep that in mind when you're trying to make a decision on how you want to play with regards to technology. Um, it is a difficult route, but I feel the rewards are exponentially uh, greater than from a financial standpoint. And there's a big ability to impact a very large percentage of the patient population with any of the solutions that you build or create. So just keep that in mind too. And no matter which way you decide, no matter how you want to move forward, uh, I'm definitely certain that all of you will be successful along your pathways as long as you take things seriously and keep pushing forward um, in your journey. Thank you both. Amazing words. Uh, sorry, we were not able to get to all the questions. They had great questions. Um, we can always access them again via YouTube and try to answer them then. But thank you, everyone, for attending. We really appreciate it. Uh, it's been an honor this evening. I'd like to thank again uh, DeepLearning.ai for the opportunity, Eastern Virginia Medical School for the opportunity to speak and to, for your students to coming to, to hear. And also for Halo Space, our technology partner who is streaming this uh, across all of their channels. So thank you all. And I hope you have a great evening and I hope you catch us again uh, for our next Pine AI. Good night, everybody. <laughs>